Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Abbott, and I am the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion on the links between education and health. Teaching self-care practices to young individuals can be a powerful tool for the prevention of health problems. Today's panel features representatives from two organizations that have developed powerful education models to empower youth in local and global communities. The social services offered by Options for Youth, like mentorship and reproductive health knowledge, benefit teens right here in Chicago. And Caring for Cambodia provides a free education for over 6,400 impoverished children in 21 schools spanning preschool to high school. I look forward to hearing more from our speakers on how these programs are gaining momentum and reaching children in need. You have a copy of their bios on your chairs, but let me briefly introduce our panelists. Jamie Emilio is the founder and CEO of Caring for Cambodia, an organization committed to educating Cambodian children. She founded Junior Vistas for Children and served on the board of directors of Vistas for Children. Also, she's the author of Stumpy the Crocodile, a children's book about helping neighbors in need. Pat Mosina is the president and founder of Options for Youth. She is the founder and director of the subsequent pregnancy program a home visiting program designed to help adolescent mothers delay a second pregnancy and graduate from high school. Our moderator is Dr. Lois Margaret Nora. Dr. Nora is the president and CEO of the American Board of Medical Specialties. Dr. Nora will lead the conversation and Q&A on stage, and please join me in welcoming our panelists and moderator. Good morning, everyone. Well. What a beginning to the morning we have all experienced over the past several hours, and you ain't seen nothing yet. So you know the American Board of Medical Specialties improves the health of people across this country and the world by overseeing board certification of physicians and surgeons across all the medical specialties from primary care, family practice, to neurosurgery. Our speakers today have been introduced. I cannot tell you how extraordinarily excited I am at having this opportunity to present these two remarkable women and the work that they have done to you. So let's just get right to it. I'm gonna begin with a question really addressed to both of you. Could you very briefly introduce us to your organization and? We're talking today about how education and health are inextricably linked. How does that play out in your particular world? Jamie, how about you begin? Well, in Caring for Cambodia, we believe that you can't have good education without healthy children. Early on, almost 13 years ago, we realized that a hungry child sitting in a classroom was not going to be able to learn. We quickly realized that as we're educating an entire country, that the teachers must also be talking to the children about good health and hygiene. And so today, our students uh, show up in the morning, they wash their hands with clean water from a water filtration system, eat a healthy breakfast, and then brush their teeth and go to school. And that's the way it should be, a sick kid will not make it through a classroom in the morning. Thank you very much. Pat. Thank you, Lois. And thank the council for allowing us to bring some local solutions to some of the issues we are all facing globally. Education and health are inextricably linked worldwide because both are essential for a young person to grow into a productive member of society and to reach her or his full potential. But if you are 15 and already have a baby to take care of and there's no heat or food in your apartment or you're being sexually abused by your mother's living boyfriend or you and your baby don't have anywhere to sleep that night, then your first priority is probably not going to be getting to school on time or doing your algebra homework. Your first priority will be survival. And although it's hard to grasp and many of us are not aware, there are many young women in Chicago today that face survival on a daily basis. 
Thank you very much. Jamie, tell us a little bit more about Caring for Cambodia and how you are helping provide the high quality education for the children throughout that country. Well, Caring for Cambodia was started because of a trip that I took. And I realized in talking with some of the locals there that I didn't know much about the genocide that had happened back in the 70s when I was alive. I was playing in a backyard and people were being murdered all over Cambodia. The people that were murdered were the teachers, the teachers, the lawyers, the doctors, anyone that was in a professional career was taken out. So this is a country that is still healing. The generation today, two thirds of them are under the age of 30. So education was key. I felt like my kids had an opportunity to go to school. And when we tend to help a country globally, it helps us back at home too. So we started with educating the teachers, training teachers. When the teachers have buy-in, then the students will have the buy-in. When the students have the buy-in to education meaning something, then the community has the buy-in. So what we've seen happen over the years is that that line of community and school has become invisible. Because after the genocide, there was no such thing as a PTA. After your family members were murdered and you didn't know how to parent your own child, there was no such thing as a hotline. So today, we're dealing with parents that are still learning how to take care of their children. And we have students that now go back home and teach their parents how to read. So we're watching an entire face of an educational system change right before us. And the key, really, at the heart of it, is making sure that it's sustainable and that all other schools around Cambodia can do the same thing we're doing. It's teacher training, it's getting the parents involved, and it's perseverance. We're going to talk about replicability and sustainability and infrastructure in a few minutes. Before, Pat, your organization supports marginalized youth and adolescents in Chicago. Tell us about how Options for Youth is making an impact in the city. Well, for the last 20 years, Options for Youth as an organization has helped to change the lives of two of the most vulnerable and at-risk populations of adolescents in the city. First time, adolescent mothers, all of whom have a baby before the age of 18, so they're very young adolescent mothers, and teenage African-American boys who are growing up and living in some of the most underserved and dangerous neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago. Now, our subsequent pregnancy project is one of the few programs in the country that focuses on helping young mothers delay a second pregnancy. There are many programs to delay the first, but there are very few uh, to focus on helping this young mother delay a second pregnancy and graduate from high school. Now, many young mothers can make it with one baby, but two or even three while you're still a teen, almost always means high school dropout, welfare dependency, and long-term poverty for the young mother and her baby. Now nationally, only a third, not 38% of the young mothers who have a baby before the age of 18 ever get their high school diploma. Among the young mothers in SPP, 90% of those eligible to graduate get their diploma each year and a majority of those are now accepted into college. Half of the young mom mothers in our program are themselves the daughters of teenage mothers. So helping these very young mothers delay a pregnancy, graduate from high school, is helping to break that intergenerational cycle of early childbearing and poverty. Among the 5,000 young mothers from 50 communities who have participated in SPP. Only 3% have had a second pregnancy while in the program, and 95% have remained in school or graduated. We have seven with master's degrees, and six have come back to work as subsequent pregnancy home visitors. Now, our participant outcomes have been consistent over time and over adolescent populations, African-Americans, Caucasians, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans. And the primary reason for the effectiveness of this program 
is the quality of the relationship between our subsequent pregnancy home visitor and each young mother. The home visitor steps in and becomes surrogate mother, sister, school advocate, academic coach, whatever it takes to keep this young mother and her baby from falling through the cracks. Thank you very much. I mean, remarkable props to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs who are bringing us today someone from our own city and someone speaking to us about Cambodia, and yet how similar in some ways such apparently different things are. Jamie, let's turn to you for a moment. How do you work with policy in Cambodia and elsewhere in implementing your plans? And what challenges and opportunities have you encountered in doing so? Well, early on when we started in Cambodia, we tried to stay under the radar because we weren't quite sure how the government was going to take another NGO coming in and helping their schools. But what happened over time is that we realized that we, need to, we needed to be partners with them. In order for those teachers to teach, we needed to use their curriculum. We quickly learned our Western ways were not the way of the world. So over time, we actually tried to work hand in hand with the Ministry of Education. And today, they would like us to do more. Why? Because we're doing what they want. They just didn't have the human resources to do it. The teachers have books on curriculum, but they didn't know how to deliver it. They didn't have teacher trainers. So when it comes to policy, it's very important for us to abide by the Cambodian rules. From culture to whatever their stats are, whatever their tests are, their achievement tests, we want to do what they want to do. We just want to help them to do it in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, more efficient way and we expect excellence and I think after a country that's gone through genocide like that Rebuilding trust and looking to see what something good really looks like was a tough road for them They're still healing today. So when you rebuild an education system It's not only about the books the teachers and the students It's about rebuilding trust in a country that lost it all so it's very difficult when we hear someone, we're run entirely on volunteers. Volunteers come in and they want to do, put a hopscotch thing on the, on the sidewalk. Well, you can't step on numbers in Cambodia. So that was a big learning curve for us. So we have to listen to what they're saying. You can't pat someone on the head. Uh, but it's small things like that that show us that we have to have an open mind and listen to what policymakers want to have happen in their own country. And I think that's a lesson for all of us in education. Education is key to this world being a better place. But if we don't do it in the right way in the country we're in, then it's not going to work. So tell me, you've emphasized cultural competence and its importance. Has, it appears that has contributed to your success. Talk about how it has contributed to your success and is your model replicable? Our model is completely replica replicable, and I'll tell you why. It's because we work from the ground up. It matters what the community says. It's not my community, it's their community. It matters what the teachers say, how the parents feel. The whole idea is for us to be able to build something we can share. What's the point of going in and trying to build a building and then walk away and come back to my country if they can't share? It's all about sustainability. Every single thing we do in our schools is what can be done around the country. We try and use indigenous materials for whatever the teacher materials are, the supplies. If they need to use bamboo or papayas, we go use bamboo and papayas. We don't bring stuff in from Target, which we used to in the beginning, and that was another lesson. Um, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch how over the years the lessons we learn and that it's it's something that we can take our model into a village 200 miles away in Cambodia and watch those teachers learn from just putting things up in their classroom decorating their classroom and showing other kids and teachers what child-friendly classrooms look like it's not the chalk and talk it's actually communicating and interacting with the students that also show them a different way to interact interact with their community and their world Thank you. Pat, talk to us about replicability of your programs, and has cultural competence played a role in that? I think if a program's going to be effective, cultural competence has to play a role, um, whether it's the culture of Cambodia or the culture of the south side of Chicago. Our subsequent pregnancy program provides two primary interventions. Intense education and training through participation 
in a group, plus an ongoing personal relationship with a subsequent pregnancy home visitor. Over the past 20 years, we've learned a lot, and our program has also grown from the ground up. But one of the major things we learned is that to be effective with our young mothers, education and training are not enough. These young women need ongoing support to navigate their own everyday lives. Our subsequent pregnancy home visitors provide ongoing social and emotional support. These young women know that her home visitor has her back, and that may be the only person in her life that she can trust or turn to for help. Our home visitors must first identify the individual needs of each young mother and her baby. Then she must leverage local community resources in order to meet those needs, whether it's childcare, um, suspension at school, welfare, a protection order for domestic violence, or helping to choose the best method of contraception for that young woman. Now, our home visitors are not nurses. They're not paraprofessionals. They're women from the community. And this is where cultural competence comes in. We train them, we support them, but it is their commitment to these young women, to these young mothers in their community, that makes our program strong. We are very replicable. Uh, we have developed the program model and the curriculum, working directly with home visitors in seven different agencies over time. We very much want to share the model, share our curriculum with any organization and our experiences with any organization who would like to start a subsequent pregnancy program in your community. Right now, we are training home visitors who are part of a health alliance in Lowell, Massachusetts. We're doing it via Skype because it's very low budget. But we are training home visitors in Lowell and we will be supporting them throughout the program year. Their program starts in April. Two years ago, we did a subsequent pregnancy workshop in San Miguel, Mexico that was supported by the MacArthur Foundation. The purpose of this workshop was to introduce the concept of delaying a second pregnancy among adolescents. Mexico has about 15 million adolescent mothers. And this workshop was attended by representatives from numerous uh, youth serving groups, as well as the Ministry of Health. So all of you responded when the low budget was just mentioned by Pat. This is something that many of us are very familiar with. So I ask both of you, if you build it, will they come? How do you make organizations like yours visible to the community so that they're aware? How do you do marketing with no budget? <laughs> We've never had a marketing it's, budget. It's, <laughs> we haven't either. It's, and it's not easy. It's difficult. I was just sharing with someone this morning, this job is not an easy job. It's about perseverance. It's about not giving up. It's about making a commitment and keeping it. And one of the things I learned in Cambodia from the locals was that when you come in and build a building and you walk away, we've given them the gift of burden. No one ever wants to do that. So when you have students that come to your schools, it's important to get out there and talk to them. That's the marketing. The marketing is the proof in the pudding when a kid goes home from school and says, I can read. Then you know that you're really doing something. And then to follow up with that is making sure that they have the support from the teachers, the community that they need. Uh, again, we're dealing with a generation that's still healing from a genocide, and it was brutal. But what's so wonderful is to see these kids rise to the occasion. If you really commit to them, you'll be surprised. Uh, we, uh, our color is orange. When we drive around and see them reap Cambodia, we see people that have orange all over the place. We see CFC t-shirts and signs that uh, we know we've been there. So that's the marketing. For marketing around the world, 
because of our volunteers, it's a lot of word of mouth, which by the way, if you'd like to volunteer, <laughs> our table's in the back there. Uh, but our volunteers are so committed because a lot of the time you can go and you can see the very children you're helping. It's an open door. Um, we arrange trips for volunteers to go and see 95 cents of every dollar goes to all of our programs. So it's imperative that we show people what we're doing. We're completely transparent. You see the very children that you're helping, and the kids in the community, see them reap in all of Cambodia, know that we're not there to just give a handout. We're really there to give a hand up and be partners in change. Thank you. Pat, what about visibility for your program? Well, Options for Youth and subsequent pregnancy, we don't bring a new classroom. We don't bring a new clinic. We don't even bring a new sports program. But we, we bring a knowledge of the young women we are serving. And we meet them where they are with the support that makes a difference and changes their young lives. We've never had a problem with visibility. Uh, we're in the community, we've been there for some time. We have m almost always more referrals to for young women who want to be in our program. And our outcomes have made both other organizations um, refer to us. Our problem has been the money to pay the home visitors. That's a key problem always has been, but visibility has never been an issue. We have never had a marketing budget and probably never will. <laughs> so this morning, and I think for many of us in the last session this morning, hearing about some of the gender issues um, that continue to be per pervasive, I wonder, could Jamie, could you begin with discussing any gender issues that you may have encountered in your work and, and how you have overcome them or, or worked with them? Well, it's only been in about the last four or five years that we've even been able to discuss that in Cambodia. It was a taboo subject. It's not something that we talked about. Yes, girls matter, but did girls really make decisions in the home, in the workplace, and in, in uh, the government? And the answer at that time was no. Today. We put together a Girls Matter program. We deal with gender issues on a regular basis. We've brought in uh, expert gender uh, equity counselors. We, we talk to the girls uh, about the power of no. Human trafficking is up almost 20% in uh, Southeast Asian countries. And I think that until we start really dealing with that in the schools and talking to those girls about what no really means and that word spreads, it's going to continue to be a problem. But now that we've had the uh, green light to actually discuss these issues, we've come out full force and making sure that we talk to the girls about issues that they wouldn't be able to talk about, perhaps even with their peers. They have a safe place at our schools, a counseling office that they can go to. Uh, and uh, one of the most important things that we've also see change is that gender equity issues are, gender issues are not uh, about girls. It's about the boys too. And no matter how we're educating the girls to act and be powerful, uh, if the boys don't treat them right, it's, it's definitely taking a step forward and two steps back. So it's, we've seen a real change. We celebrate Women's International Day. We've just had a big program for all the girls, the female students. As a matter of fact, our, our female students rate higher on science exams than any other school in the entire country. We're so proud of that. So it's, it's a difficult issue. It's one that has to be hit head on. And we have to talk about some pretty scary things with them. But now it's getting better. Pat? Thanks primarily to the international community, the topic of gender equity is now very popular and almost all curriculum have a gender equity module. This is a very critical concept to the young men and women we deal with. Before they join our programs, almost all of the girls and boys who join our groups have gotten their sexual and reproductive health education from the street, where girls tend to be viewed as sexual targets and the concept of a healthy relationship being something you work toward is never non-existent. Because this is such a critical issue for our young people, we take a slightly different approach to teaching gender equity and equality all of our young mothers in our subsequent pregnancy project 
and all of our teenage boys in our peer advocate project are all given a full year of training, education and training, using basically the same curriculum. Because Jamie is right, you do have to give it to both sides of the equation. After the year, they are asked to do co-ed presentations to their schools and their communities. And we have found that planning and preparing a community presentation for your peers by these well-trained young people, but that requires them to listen to the perspective of the opposite sex and why they are making decisions and why they are choosing the lifestyles that they are. This is the most effective way we have found to teach gender equity to our program participants. I'll give you one example. When they come to our programs, the concept of a healthy relationship is something they've never thought about. But after they have been trained, after they have shared the views of the opposite sex, then healthy relationships, and they begin to recognize the stereotypical negative roles and role models in their own communities, then healthy relationships becomes the most popular program, a uh, popular topic for them to present to their peers. Great. I'm going to explore two more questions with our guests before we turn the questioning open to all of you. Um, the first is we've heard from remarkable leaders this morning. I'm a student of leadership. What are your thoughts about the next steps for your organization, your hopes, your dreams, what gets you up in the morning? Or what leadership learning would you like to leave with our audience? Jamie, I'll start with you and then turn to you, Pat. My hope and dream for Caring for Cambodia is to one day walk away from Cambodia and say, wow, it was great working with you. Um, rebuilding an entire educational system does not happen in a year doesn't really even happen in a decade. So I would say the fact uh, that I'm a little impatient has not been one of my uh, strengths with this organization because I want so bad for those kids to do things on their own and that government to do things on their own. But coming from a leadership standpoint, I've always felt it was important to give my volunteers the power of making a decision. This organization can't be just my organization. One of the wonderful things about CFC is that we have incredibly smart people, kind and committed, uh, that are all throughout the organization. So if someone wants to work with the curriculum, call the teachers over on the other side of the world. We have teachers in Singapore, we have teachers in Australia, in uh, Tokyo, all over. Go ahead and reach out. Stay within the guidelines of what we have, but make a decision and make this organization your own. I think that the Cambodian government would like to see us partner for some time to come which I'm fine with that, as long as we can see the future leaders of Cambodia come up through this type of school, this model, when the teachers are well-trained, the students go to school and they understand what a real education means and don't take it for granted. Uh, I, I value every person that puts a minute, an hour into our, our organization, $10, $1,000, it all matters. And I think as a leader, to be able to say thank you, celebrate the small successes, really focus on the critical few and not the trivial many is absolutely dire to the success. Otherwise, we get what I call charity drift where you want to fix everything and you cannot, then it's not sustainable. So those critical few, letting our volunteers make decisions on their own and own this program as well and making sure that the government knows that we're not going to be there forever. Thank you. Pat, your hopes and dreams. Options for youth outcomes over time demonstrates that investment in these young people that their schools often have written off, society has often written off, positively impacts not only their own lives, but their broader communities. But this type of long-term commitment and investment takes time and it takes resources. But as we as a country or as a city are not willing to take responsibility for these young people, then we will lose them. 
an organization like mine is only as strong as the staff and the people who work there. I have probably the most talented and the most committed staff in the country, and our outcomes show this. Uh, they're definitely not in it from their money. Um, so we've always been uh, from the bottom up, but our outcomes show that the bottom up works and it can change the lives of young people who would otherwise be lost. I am struck in listening to our panelists how important it is as a leadership principle to find your passion because it is your passion that calls you to the kind of leadership you are exerting. As our Q&A moderator is coming up, let me ask one other question and Ruth. What haven't you had the chance to say, if anything, that you want to make sure we hear about your organization today? I don't think we have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that one of the things that I want to say where I hope you all leave today with the fact, uh, just in the back of your mind, knowing that if you want to start an organization and if you want to do something in making the world a better place, you can do it. People often ask me, why Cambodia? I didn't choose it, it chose me. I went there on vacation. And to <laughs> see kids in that type of environment was just completely wrong. So I think when we see something and it bothers us, that we should take initiative and do something. I think we need to stay bothered about the world we live in not being right, that kids don't have the education they need or don't eat the meal that they deserve. Uh, one of my hopes for, for caring for Cambodia children is that those kids, they do go from preschool to 12th grade, but after 12th grade, I want them to come back and give back to that community. So I, I think that one of the big misconceptions in the world with NGOs today is that you can just go in and start a little something and hope that it'll keep going on its own. But the truth is, if you want to do something, you have to stick with it. So sticking with it and staying bothered about change makes the world a better place. It really does. I'd like to share uh, one vivid um, memory. Um, Charisse tells the story of getting on a Greyhound bus Charisse was a young mother in her program, and she likes to tell the story of getting on a Greyhound bus to go to college in Carbondale. Charisse had a baby on her hip and everything she owned in a black plastic bag. Her mother was a drug addict, and she didn't even know she had left. But because of Charisse's home visitor and her unconditional support, Charisse now has her master's degree She's counseling other young mothers, and she just wrote her first book talking about her life experiences. So it does happen, and it can happen. But I'd like to leave you th with this one thought. There is no one size fits all. And meeting the needs of young people at a pivotal time in their lives can determine their life course. Wow, huh? <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have some time now for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your arm, and once I've called on you, a member of our staff will bring a microphone to you. Yes, ma'am, about halfway back. Hi, thanks to all of you for being here. That was really great. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I liked what you said, Jamie, about kind of following your passion and when you feel upset about something to do that, but I think there's also an issue where people from relatively privileged backgrounds come into places and see th something that upsets them and think that they know how to solve that problem. So I'm wondering for both of you, like personally and professionally, how do you balance that, you kind of checking your own privilege and ensuring that the communities you're working with are driving the decisions you're making in your organization? I think you have to listen. Um, most people at least most of the youth that we uh, work with know what they need. Uh, if you're willing to step in next to them and provide the support and the guidance and to help them get over hurdles. So I think uh, many organizations, and especially today when there's all this emphasis on evidence-based and taking uh, models in to communities, 
I think the answers have to come from the ground up. I believe that to whom much is given, much is expected. I live by that saying. And I think that running an NGO is not about the focus of education. It's also about the people that you have around you. It's about the 300 students that I spoke to at a high school last week and said, you can do something. That's giving the community power to go and try and make change. We certainly live in a very privileged world here in the United States of America. Really, really privileged. And I try and share with anyone that I can, I have a minute with, to just really give a little something. It does matter. It all matters, as long as we do something. I'd like to add one thing to that. Many of us are living in privileged environments, but not all of us, and we have to remember that. Yes, in the front row, please. Uh, and the microphone's on its way. Uh, uh, how are both of your organizations partnering with other nonprofits um, just so that it's not, you know, redundancy and working together might um, elevate your impact? The needs of our young people are so myriad that we have to partner with many organizations just to provide stability for the young mothers and babies and young men in our program. So partnering um, is, is critical to us in order to serve our young people. We partner with uh, schools, we partner with health clinics, we partner with WIC, we partner with daycare centers, we partner with crisis nurseries, we partner with anybody who has a service that our young people may need. For the first few years, I wouldn't partner with anyone because I wanted to make sure that we didn't mess things up. Uh, and now we have several partners around the world. I, I, it also mirrors what you're saying as far as uh, schools around the world. Uh, health and de we have a health and dental team. We work with uh, health clinics in Singapore that's a one-on-one -on -one partner with us that goes and does dental checks. As a matter of fact, we just did vision screening. And because of the genocide, it's been a very tough go to get kids and parents to think about wearing glasses again. Uh, we work with the local hospital there. One of our best partnerships has been with an organization called Feed My Starving Children. And they actually package, well, volunteers go and package the food. So it's, it's a, a two-prong approach to being able to help a country in need and doing work right here in your own hometown. Uh, they send food over to Cambodia. We have our locals there and pack it. And every day, our kids receive two meals a day. We serve over 240,000 meals a month. So that partnership is key to the success and good health of the children. And if, if someone's doing something in education and we can share or benchmark from that, that's what it's all about. On the side, please. Good morning, and thanks for a great presentation. My question is for Pat. In the lessons learned about the curriculum that you've developed for the home visitors, is there an opportunity for civic partnership with the city colleges? because many successful intervention programs now for elderly or children with medical complexity where my work is involves a home visitor or a patient navigator. Is there an opportunity to take your curriculum bigger so that more agencies could um, get qualified home visitors or patient navigators to do these interventions? A very good question. Uh, there are many, many home visiting programs around the country now. That's um, it was like home visiting had just been discovered. We've been doing it for 20 years. And, uh, but I think what many organizations, and I know this is true, they fail to provide the training and the ongoing support that their home visitors need to do their job. We met with our home visitors around the state every month for 10 years when we were developing our program model and curriculum. So that is the key element that's often, often left out in programs. Oh, we have home visitors, they go do your job. But it's a hard job. And the support and the training that they receive is critical. And the, towards the back, please. Um, first, thank you for today. This has been wonderful. I'm wondering, for, um, for you, Jamie, for caring for Cambodia, 
You had mentioned Feed My Starving Children, which is um, an evangelical organization. I'm wondering if Caring Cam for Cambodia has that element to it as well, and if so, how do you partner with the Ministry of Education? What does that relationship look like as a Buddhist country? We have all walks of life in our organization. We are not run by one belief. We believe in educating children. It doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or Jewish or Buddhist. Uh, and Feed My Starving Children is fantastic in the sense that they start with a prayer every meeting. I think that's great. In, uh, in Cambodia, we respect the religion of the country as Buddhism. We are partners with the Ministry of Education, and they understand that our entire goal is to help them change the face of education. Um, we have so many walks of life, from people that live paycheck to paycheck that help, and others that are, are extremely blessed and give more than the normal. Um, but there is no basis to our organization being run by one religion. I don't impose my personal beliefs, nor do any of our volunteers, on anyone in Cambodia and within the CFC family. In the front row, Jim Litvak, please. Good morning. Thank you so much for an absolutely inspiring conversation. Um, we're all here because we care about these issues. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would say to you, though, that Cambodia is as far out of mind as it is in distance, and even some of these communities within our own city feel like a world away. How have, what successful strategies have you employed to get people to care about these issues that may feel really far away from them? People ask me that all the time. Why are you doing something over in Cambodia and not in the United States? Well, there's been a valuable lesson that's been learned in Cambodia and one of a, that I think that we could use in the United States with the education system. We actually pay our teachers by an incentive-based pay program. So if you do really well, you get paid more and you get bonuses. Uh, when I talk to people about the lessons we learn over there and how we can transfer that to the US, I think that, that tends to spark more of, converse, of conversation and perhaps a light bulb goes off. I believe that in helping every child in this world, it makes our country a better place. Why Cambodia? There's a lot of you in here that probably didn't even realize what the killing fields were or who the Khmer Rouge was or what Pol Pot did to that country. It's not, we learn in our textbooks about the Nazis and what happened in Germany. But do we understand what happened in Cambodia? The US actually dropped more bombs over in Cambodia than all the bombs combined in World War II during the Vietnam War time period. And that's important to me because I feel like we can learn from those mistakes as a country. And it's important to bring what happens in other countries back to our, our country for discussion. Our young people need to know, and again, there's so many people here, you probably didn't even realize that two and a half million people were murdered between 1975 and 79. It's not in our textbooks, and I believe it should be. And you're exactly right. So many people don't know what the neighborhood five miles away is like or what the young people growing up in the neighborhood are facing every day. Uh, I wish I knew the answer to get that message out. If we could get that message out, all of our lives would be easier. Um, we're a very small organization. We're not well known. Uh, the most effective communicators for, to tell about what we have done is the young mothers themselves. And we use those whenever we can. But our greatest need is for somebody to tell that these children are growing up like this and we can do something. It just takes someone willing to help. We have time for one remaining question. On the side, please. Jamie, I'm so glad that you mentioned teacher evaluation. We're having right now in Chicago a massive debate on how to evaluate our own teachers. Can you help us with some great ideas on how to? <laughs> <laughs> Another one we don't have time for. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I, we don't have a union in <laughs> Cambodia. So the teachers really don't have to answer to anyone but their ministry. And the ministry expects excellence today. It didn't some years ago. And I think that we're losing that in our educational systems in the United States today. Teachers are the most important people we have. They are raising our children. You're sending your kids to school and you are depending on someone else to teach them about the world. 
The evaluations that we go by are something that would mirror any school in the US. It's just that the results are actually dealt with on a different basis. If your classroom is failing, if your kids aren't showing up, if you're coming in late, if your classroom is dirty, then you need to answer to someone for it. And I think that those evaluations need to be shared more with our educational system. We have mentor teachers. There's not too many mentor teachers in our schools. We have lead teachers. These are teachers that go and sit in on a classroom and help and give feedback and actually make it a two-way conversation about what they're doing in the classroom and then what they could do better. So it's the, commit the teachers committing to want to do better, which I don't know how many teachers in the US are always committing to that. And again, it's the most important what profession I feel like we have for our children today. Our teachers don't get paid enough here in the US. So the excellence we expect is also going to be an issue. But the evaluations are something that lots of schools, I think, should use more on a regular basis. And it so often is the basic things that a teacher should be doing every single day. May I add one quick, uh, may I add one um, other view? Um, given what young people are growing up, some young people are growing up today, uh, in the world they live in, we can't expect our teachers to do everything. Uh, we're expecting them to do academic stimulation. We expect them to be mental health counselors. We're expecting them to feed the children who don't have food. I think we have to be fair in what it is we're asking our teachers to do. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists and moderators.
Cells in Nigeria to the Syrian civil war which has displaced millions of children. Women and girls face a variety of unique dangers and conflict zones, including trafficking and abuse, and are more likely to be denied proper medical care. But there are organizations working hard to solve these persistent atrocities. These NGOs face intense competition for resources and a set of international institutions which are often too slow to incorporate the current and relevant research. I look forward to hearing today's panel, which will explore both on-the-ground initiatives and a research and policy approach to supporting women and girls in conflict zones. Our first panelist is Sarah Kambu. Sarah is the president of the International Center for Research on Women. She has advised both President Barack Obama and President Bill Clinton on global development projects. She was appointed by President Obama to the President's Global Development Council and by President Bill Clinton to serve as an advisor to the Clinton Global Initiative. She previously lived in Sub-Saharan Africa where she managed signature programs for care. Our next panelist is Ann Peterson. Ann is the Senior Vice President of AmeriCares. She formerly served as an assistant administrator to USAID's Global Health Bureau and has worked as a consultant for the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization. Our moderator is Dina Smeltz. Dina is a senior fellow on public opinion and foreign policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She will lead the conversation in the Q&A on stage. Please join me in welcoming our panelists and moderator. Thank you, Avery. Um, as Avery just described in her introductory remarks, crisis comes in multiple forms. Sometimes it's infectious disease. Sometimes it's armed conflict. Sometimes it's natural disasters. Um, I'd like to know from our panelists how their organizations specifically define a crisis zone. So why don't we start with Anne? Um, I work for AmeriCares, which is a global health and disaster response organization. And most of the, the crisis situations that we are working with are either natural disasters, some in some unsettled conflict zones, but I will also say that our development work, which we don't usually think of as crisis situations, includes lots of crises for for women and girls across the world. So El Salvador, where we have an ongoing clinic, has one of the highest homicide rates in the world. That's a crisis for women and girls who are trying to access care. Um, same thing when we talk about things like obstetric fistula. We think that has to do with childbirth, but it doesn't always. Sometimes it's rape in areas around Africa. So when we look at what crisis, we look both at the individual and at the countries. Um, my personal drive is to get our organization and other organizations more involved in the actual conflict zones because as we've improved the life for women and um, girls in pretty stable places, more and more of them are either hidden within countries that are doing pretty well or they're in conflict zones. And that's a really tough nut to crack, but we can actually make a difference even in conflict zones. And Sarah, does ICRW define conflict zones in a similar way, or does it have a different twist? Yes, I would, I would agree with what Anne was saying in terms of looking at fragility and uh, the context in particular and what has been the experience of people on the ground. What are women and girls, men and boys, you know, really confronting in terms of their health and well-being? Um, and this point that Anne was, uh, was making, I'd, I'd really just like to underscore that at that acute phase, when you know, we're just experiencing massive upheaval uh, in what we would consider to be a conflict-induced uh, crisis, or the first, very first phase of a natural disaster, then those first responders that are going in are doing life-saving work. And you think of Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, you know, for example, who, who go in and have the skills, the equipment, um, you know, even the, the connections on the ground to be able to do that kind of work. The International Center for Research on Women is not a first responder. We're researchers. Um, we go in at a point where it's appropriate 
to take a moment and understand the context and begin to understand the multiple vulnerabilities that are at play. And I think maybe one of the concepts I could introduce at this part in the conversation, again, to build off of what Anne was saying previously, is we like to look at fragility uh, in terms of an organizing concept. And if you look at the model that's been developed by the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, they also, you know, given their knowledge, their global knowledge of these kinds of situations, point us to look at five different dimensions within fragility. The first is violence, which we've already uh, referred to this morning in terms of um, El Salvador as, as well as, you know, sexual assault. Um, in conflict settings. The next is justice and, you know, a recourse to uh, action for those who have been wronged. Then it's institutions. Are institutions responsive to their populations? Do people have recourse for action? After that, we're looking at um, resilience and communities' ability to adapt to a crisis to um, you know, the various shocks that they are enduring across these different kinds of uh, situations. So that's very important in understanding these multiple vulnerabilities and under all of that, as we know, are gender inequalities and power relationships within relationships, within communities, within institutions that create a very disproportionate burden on women and girls in these kinds of situations. So a little wonky, but just to help, I think, set uh, a discussion where health, we may have a very vertical understanding of health and what that means. And I would posit that we need to think across other dimensions that would include violence against women and girls and even some social problems that we haven't raised yet in the discussion. So is there um, a particular type of crisis that brings more challenges than others, or is there a specific phase or, uh, of fragility that is more challenging than, than other stages? I would go with Sarah that the initial stage in any sort of acute onset crisis is both the hardest and people are most vulnerable. So I was part of the response to the 2004-2005 Indonesia tsunami. And one of the things that I learned as I was on the ground that UNICEF made their number one priority not bringing in food and water, which is one of their normal, but protection. Because in the first 24 hours after the tsunami, the sex traffickers got there almost before the re, um, NGOs and the relief agents. And so if you didn't protect them right away, they were already gone in, in a place you couldn't protect. So that a very initial stage is really important. Um, that raises a really huge issue relative to crisis, and that is most of the international respondents can't get there in the first 24 hours. You, you really have to be there unless it's Haiti in your backyard and you can get there from the US in, in six hours. So we talk now a lot about the disaster cycle from response to recovery to preparedness. And so one of the keys in some of these really acute, dangerous sort of situations is facilitating and building resilience before the disaster happens. And we know where the conflict countries are, and we know where the natural disasters happen, and more and more the natural disasters are happening in conflict zones, at least with the worst results. So we should, in fact, be proactively getting in there and making a difference, making sure the protections are there for women and girls in those first 24 hours, and that means local capacity. Yeah, I very much agree with what Anne is saying and uh, this, this whole cycle of how can we be prepared moving forward uh, so that we can respond as quickly as possible at that acute phase, um, I think is, is critical moving forward. Uh, interesting fact, uh, OSHA, uh, the UN um, Organization for the Coordination of Humanitarian uh, Affairs, just recently reported that the average duration of displacement for conflict uh, affected populations is now 17 years. Yeah. yeah, 17 years. So the acute 
phase is important for life-saving intervention. If we're looking at 17 years in, a me in, in many of these fragile uh, settings, then we really do need to understand what are those multiple layers of vulnerability and how do we begin to look at these domains of fragility in terms of creating a response that builds resilience and puts communities on the pathway you know, for a happier future. The only other point I'd like to make at this intersection is that um, sometimes, uh, I think it's due to media cycles, um, we hear this is the worst disaster since, this is the greatest atrocity, this is, I think it's important to refrain from a hierarchy of harms. Mm -hmm. If you're the individual, that is painful to you and your family, you are thrust into a world that very few of us, hopefully, uh, know in this room and will ever experience. So, you know, I, I just think that that's an important overlay as we have this kind of conversation. It's all horrible. Yeah, if I could just add about the sort of the long term, because I focused on those first 24 hours, but I would completely agree. When the media attention stops, the money stops, mm -hmm. the attention and need is, it's harder to get it addressed. Many of the initial respondents go home. And I give the example of Katrina in New, Lo New Orleans. We're in the US and there are people still displaced from that event here in this country. Why do we think Haiti or Nepal or Indonesia is gonna get better in a year? It's yeah. just totally crazy. So the, the most um, recent really awful example in my mind is Ebola in West Africa. One, we responded really late because it wasn't one of those natural disaster acute onset things. Mm -hmm. And then everybody felt so bad and so scared that they did this tunnel vision on Ebola, which in some ways was needed. But when I went and talked to the women in the slums of the capitals of both Liberia and Sierra Leone, they said, you know, my kids are still getting sick and dying of the things they did before. Yeah. Malaria is more likely, diarrhea is more likely, and all of the work to address those issues for women and children stopped, because right. everyone was paying attention. And now we have in incredibly high rates of maternal mortality, mm -hmm. all of the childhood diseases. We also had all of the schools closed, and so you had girls at home at risk, and at least in one vi village, about 80% of the girls of teenage years got pregnant in one year because they were no longer protected. So we, as you said, it's multidisciplinary and we have to stay for the long haul and both funding streams, who responds, and the vision has always been short-term acute, it's gonna be done quickly and that's a myth. You both mentioned um, challenges with displacement and so I think for all of us, one of the natural place, uh, situations we think about now is Syria and the Syria migration crisis. Um, I know Sarah, you're working on a mobile service delivery program in northern Lebanon. Yes. Right, using yeah. a, a, a new model. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about, about that oh, model? Yes, uh, thanks, really delighted to be able to share that. Um, the International Center for Research on Women is working with um, the Intermediate International Medical Corps, <coughs> excuse me, in, in northern Lebanon, looking at the condition of Syrian refugees. And you realize um, so many of these refugees are living in either urban areas, they've been integrated into homes, or they're working in informal uh, settlement uh, camps. So, so reaching uh, women and girls, men and boys, because remember, men and boys are also vulnerable uh, to violence and abuse uh, in these kinds of transitional settings. Um, we've been really delighted to have this opportunity to evaluate an innovative uh, methodology where um, because of um, women's distance, and I mean both physical distance as well as social distance to services, um, the, the uh, NGO is actually bringing services into the community. And they do that once a week over a period of six months. These services are provided in centers that are um, familiar to the women, schools, mosques, community centers. Um, it's a very holistic kind of 
um, service in that, especially when we're dealing with survivors, <clears throat> excuse me, we really have to be sure that these are quality, accessible, survivor-centered <coughs> services. In other words, understanding the woman's psychological as well as her physical health and how to support her and you know her, her, her family as she goes through in terms of uh, assimilating what's happening to her and how she decides to move forward. So the, the great news is that we're using qualitative methods and Anne and I were having mm -hmm. an exchange right before the panel that it's important at whatever phase it makes sense for a research organization like the International Center for Research on Women to go in and work with AmeriCares or with Mercy Corps or with IMC, that we use the appropriate methodologies that don't have to be heavy, expensive, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking years to get results. We can do very good program assessments that help us understand what's working, where do we want to make changes, what might we want to do differently moving forward so that we tweak an intervention so that it can be more impactful in the moment because that's what we're looking to do, is to provide services uh, to women and girls. And also for us, very importantly, that we're informing the global uh, development community on what should we be thinking about now as we go into new situations that will be very similar to northern Lebanon. And Anne, AmeriCares is very engaged in Syria as well. Can you tell us about some of your initiatives? Yeah, sure. So I'm both really excited and a little dismayed at the media attention to, um, to Syria. I'm glad it's sort of back on the agenda. Um, I'm dismayed because uh, it's getting the attention because of the migration out of the Middle East up into Europe and, you know, the picture of the small boy. So that's a lovely story to get attention. The problem is they're doing that very dangerous trek because the, the life they're leaving is really bad. And there are, in Turkey alone, four million Syrian refugees. Two million of them are in refugee camps, and at least two million are sort of embedded into the communities. Their life is so terrible there, they've already left Syria, which was worse, um, that they're having to make the migration. And so I feel very strongly we're missing the boat if we're waiting till they are headed to Europe. We should be working in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan. If you can get across and impact in Syria, you should do that as well. So what AmeriCares is doing, we do a lot of medicines and medical supplies. We work with local um, NGOs, uh, one of which is the Syrian American Medical Association, which has Syrian um, expat diaspora who are wanting to help their own people. And so we bring in the medicines and supplies to deal with turkeys and community and for SAMs to actually bring them across into Syria or at least to provide services right at the border between Syria and Turkey. And every time we reach the, um, the community groups, I think we really make it a, a major difference. Most of the UN agencies and other NGOs go to the half of the refugees who are sitting in the refugee camps, which need help, but also we need to be dealing with the community, and therefore we try very hard to work with the um, the local NGOs and others, so we can have that uh, cover better coverage because we're doing the things that some of the other organizations are not doing. Is it okay? I would love to bring up the issue of uh, child early forced marriage, particularly as it relates to the Syrian uh, situation. And I was um, really pleased to hear Anne uh, raise the, the country of Jordan, which of course has um, hosted uh, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees, many of them uh, for long periods of time. And uh, there was a very important uh, UN uh, summit held in Argentina um, oh, uh, maybe six, seven months ago. And the Minister of Social Affairs from Jordan was there. And she was basically uh, making a plea uh, to the various assembled um, organizations, governments, uh, philanthropies, to assist the government in Jordan in helping to address the epidemic of child marriages that was happening among Syrian refugees in Jordan. So just quick definition, child marriage is the, the marriage of a young girl, 
usually to a man significantly older before her 18th birthday. Right now, um, if we look at demographic data, there's about 700 million uh, child brides living you know, a, a, across the world. That's about 10% of the world's population. We have um, child early forced marriage right here in the United States. If you'd like to talk about that, we could do it later. But what happens in a crisis situation where you have a harmful traditional practice that is, is basically being practiced by parents as a way to protect the honor and, and of their daughter, um, hopefully to give her position and stature in life. Um, you know, also, quite frankly, in poor families, uh, to reduce their, the economic burden of, of raising a girl on the family. What happens in crisis? All of those social networks, those social support systems that would have been there to help a family perhaps get a girl through high school before thinking of marrying her, those are completely disrupted. And the, um, the threat of violence, sexual assault um, in these kinds of trans transitional communities is very much heightened. And so what the minister was saying is that right now in Syria, Child marriage, so the prevalence of child marriage is 51% among Syrian refugees. What was it in pre-war Syria? 13 to 17%. So that's why when we're thinking of health, we really have to broaden our horizons and think of these social situations that actually create vulnerability for girls because we know that Pregnancy and delivery-related uh, complications are among the leading causes of death for adolescent girls aged 15 to 19 years worldwide. So just bringing in this, again, this concept of fragility, multiple layers of vulnerability, and the need to think beyond uh, that initial acute phase of any uh, crisis. It just as a physician, when I think about that level of early childhood marriage, which implies sexual activity, and often in many cultures, you're supposed to prove that you're fertile and have a child very soon. You know, a 13-year-old's body is not quite ready yet to have children. The mor mortality rates are much higher, so it's not only the major cause of death for that group, they are significantly more at risk than a 21-year-old who, who gets pregnant. So for every year you can delay that first birth, you're going to reduce the health consequences, not only during childbirth, but also the consequences after that. And it's both for the mother and the child. So we know that having babies close together um, increases the death rate for mothers, babies, and the older children. So it becomes you know, just a major um, endeavor. And I also just think about, well, going back to the, the storytelling and the individual, I can't think of it anything worse than being pregnant with a small child and running for your life from bad people. Wow, we just have to do something about that. So picking up on that theme, how can we increase youth programs to, um, to continue education and health in affected communities? And also, how can we engage men and boys in, in the education as well? So the first I would, for specifically for Syrian refugees, I would, I, I don't think we as a, a, a country or many of the NGOs can fix what's happening inside Syria though we do some telemedicine across the border. It, for me, the focus should be at in Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, really addressing the needs of that population and making it safe for them there so that they can go to school, that they can get the health care they need. They're gonna be there for a long time, probably a really long time. And so if I can take care, help take care of their needs, in those countries so they don't have to move along. That's just a symptom of the problem. I think it's really important. I'll give one other story that goes all the way back to my years in sub-Saharan Africa dealing with the AIDS epidemic. I did a lot of work in AIDS prevention with youth. And um, in the University of Zimbabwe, they did this, uh, they call it a problem posing poster, and it was a picture of a rich man nice, portly, smoking a cigarette, leaning on his car, and a young schoolgirl in her <coughs> school uniform. And when I show it to an American audience, they go, hmm? 
when I show it to an African audience, they go, oh yeah, we know what's going on. This is the sugar daddy, he's the teacher, he's the principal, he's the authority figure, and I say, and what's gonna happen to her? Well, she's gonna go home and sleep with him. Does she have any choice? No, she has no choice whatsoever. And so we start talking through that, and my favorite time in all of the times that I've done that kind of um, discussion with middle school kids is when we um, talk about to the boys, if this was your sister or this was your girlfriend, what is your responsibility to protect her? Do you want her, this to happen to her? How could you stop it? And are you gonna be the sugar daddy when you grow up? And not all of them, but some of them, you can see the light go on and go, oh my goodness, if this was my sister and girlfriend, I could do something. I could go take her hand, walk her away, something else, and just begin to make it real to the boys as well as the girls that there are some solutions, but it's hard. So I'd like to split it into two, yeah. Um, first, I think that there's really major policy gaps in terms of looking at not just, uh, you know, the particular situation of women um, in these kinds of, of crisis settings, um, and that goes with, you know, all that we've been uh, discussing here today. But now let's look at generations, because we've um, positioned the particular vulnerabilities of adolescent girls. And here we have an enormous policy gap, not only here within the United States, but through global institutions and across the world. What we have available to us, we have so many um, conventions and you know, guidelines and standards, they're wonderful, but they're focused on two very different populations. One is women and involving them um, through 1325 in, in, in peace talks and making sure that they're involved in, in creating more resilient uh, communities and nations as we move forward from crisis. Then we look at um, specifically uh, sexual violence in conflict settings, that's through 1820. So that's very much focusing on, I would say, an older group of women. On the other side of the equation, we have child protection extremely important standards, guidelines, convec uh, conventions that protect the rights and well-being of children. Unfortunately, adolescent girls fall betwixt and between. Now there's things within both of those um, frameworks that we could adapt that would be excellent support for adolescent girls who may be, for example, experiencing heightened uh, vulnerability to child marriage uh, during conflicts. What do we need to consider in order to make uh, us have a more robust policy framework moving forward? Because we have an increasingly uh, fragile world. We'll be dealing with this, unfortunately, on a much more regular basis moving forward. So I think that um, there's wonderful things that you know, folks like AmeriCares, Mercy Corps, um, others who are intervening in more of these crisis phases of conflict, natural disaster, um, that they could do to integrate the voices of adolescent girls and adolescent boys, I don't mean to exclude them, mm -hmm. so that the different services, programs are meeting their needs and that they're able to shape them and actually maybe help implement them wherever they may be sitting uh, within a conflict. So that would be, I think, um, something very, very important uh, for us to do at that policy and program level. I'd like to link the policy and program together and say that uh, I'm in an implementing world, I've been in the academic world as well, and when I think about the, um, the vulnerability of women and girls. Part of the reason we know is that there's been some good research done on the needs of women um, and girls, and that then helps those of us who are implementers to say, yeah, we gotta pay attention to it. But um, what we need is the data. So we know that they're more vulnerable, we know that they have harder access. If you're in a crisis or a conflict situation, it's the elderly, the disabled, the pregnant women, and the unaccompanied children who don't get there for the food drop or the water drop or the health services. 
the respondents may not realize that because they see the people who do show up. So the only way you begin to recognize that you've got your most vulnerable population out there not being addressed and helped is to be paying attention to the data. If there's you know, so many kids in the population, so many women in the population, and you're seeing less than that, you're missing your key population and you need to figure out how to either bring the services out to them or find a way to safely bring them in because sometimes they know it's there, they could get there, but it's not safe to make the journey. So here's a place where data becomes very important. Even really, really rough data helps you know that you're missing and you have to change something that you're doing. I'll give um, one example, if I can, from Afghanistan. Sure. I was a part of um, a lot of the work post-Taliban in the rebuilding, and at that time, Afghanistan had the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. I mean, just unbelievable. And the donors came in and said, let's build hospitals in Kabul. And the Minister of Health, who happened to be a woman, an ob surgeon, and a general in the Afghan army, how did that, how did she manage to do that and survive through the Taliban, I don't know. But she said, my, my women are dying in childbirth. That's what we're going to deal with. And it's all happening in the rural areas. And so she built a, a whole rebuilding that focused on community midwives building up the different skill sets. And the other thing they did was they put together, it sounds so silly, like right after a conflict or in the middle of a semi-conflict situation, a health management information system, a great big data system that tracked what was going on. And then they knew what services to get where, where the populations were, when they were making um, progress, how to get the commodities out, and it did two things. Child mortality went down like 23% in three to four years. Maternal mortality plummeted <coughs> from 1600 to 337 in, in about eight or nine years, and it, that's a little bit of fuzzy data, as you might <laughs> expect. Um, and it reduced corruption because there was greater transparency. It didn't eliminate it, but as one of the doctors that I worked with said, you know, it used to be our size, whoever you know, the president was, his best friend got the job without merit. Now that there was transparency, they had to at least have the basic credentials, and then his best friend got the job, but at least they <laughs> had the skill sets. So, I mean, who would have thought that data could, one, safeguard prioritizing our services and at the same time reduce corruption in some of these conflict-prone countries? Yeah, I just really appreciate, you know, the story of the success in Afghanistan, and you gotta love data, and I just <laughs> thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. I think in these kinds of settings, you know, you have to look at not only gender disaggregated data, but age disaggregated yeah. data, and then please let me just go back to my multiple vulnerabilities. We want to understand ethnicity, yeah. class, caste, religion, orig origin, language group, all of these different aspects of identity become almost um, like the perfect storm under these kinds of conditions. And that's the kind of information that will help you craft, you know, I think the most hopefully impactful uh, interventions that are possible in these conditions. I, I have to endorse data too, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, well, just before we go to questions from the audience, uh, I wanted to give you, you've sprinkled throughout your uh, discussion, um, examples of engaging the local population in designing solutions. So if you wanted to add anything on that, mm -hmm. and if you wanted to um, suggest for the rest of us in the audience, if we would like to get involved, if you have any uh, comments on the best ways to do that. I'll start with the Ebola. Um, for me, part of the reason it took so long to get it under control is that the, the respondents were talking to the government and not the community. And when we talked to the women in the community, we got a different understanding of what would motivate them for dealing with Ebola as well as their other health issues. So now we're facing another infectious disease outbreak, Zika, and we're very, very involved in Zika. We have lots of partners throughout Latin America, and we have a clinic in El Salvador, and it's the same kind of thing. CDC has their, their list of 
you know, what you should be doing. It's going to change as we go along because we're certainly learning um, as the outbreak shows us new things about the Zika infection. But we talk to our folks on the ground and we say, well, pregnant women all need to be using um, insecticide. And they said, we don't use insecticide in this country. And I'm going, oh no, what do I do? And so we've been doing that dialogue of what are their normal practices, what does it take to um, encourage a change in behavior that is not a cultural norm, how far do we push because this is a scientific best practice that we know from other diseases, and how much do we help find local solutions that will still protect and address the epidemic. And so we've been doing a lot of that um, cultural grounding and then also bringing um, both the data and then following the CDC recommendations. Uh, we've got a little flyer um, which was out on our table. We'll also have it up on our website. I'm specifically um, also looking at the vulnerability of women and girls at our clinic in El Salvador. We're seeing an uptick in pregnant women asking for ultrasounds. Well, we know why they're asking for ultrasounds, because they want to know if their baby's okay. Um, but I'm trying to see if we can get more family planning commodities so that during this time when there is uh, uncertainty about the um, likelihood of malformations from Zika during pregnancy, you give women the opportunity. Latin America has pretty good family planning access now, I am sh but there's always what we call the contraceptive prevalence gap. There's always a gap between those who aren't ready to get pregnant this, this day, this year, and their access to services. I am sure that gap is going to get bigger as the reality of Zika and the consequences to babies um, becomes more prominent. And so we're trying very hard to open up new partnerships in Latin America and get family planning with a very strong emphasis on addressing both the, the reality of the Zika risks, but also the anxieties of the Zika risks as women during this time of great joy are now going, oh no, is my baby going to be okay? So this is like our last pitch, right? <laughs> so I would really love to um, pick up on the issue of, of men and boys and masculinities, you know, how men um, consider the ideal man and how they might, um, you know, place themselves on a spectrum of, of masculinities and how um, through uh, ICRW and work that we did with CARE uh, in Northwest Balkans, we actually used participatory methodologies that are um, deeply, deeply, deeply embedded in the Frarian uh, principles of uh, constantization and actualization. And um, essentially, we were working in uh, vocational technical institutes in five countries of Northwest Balkans and working with young men aged 12 to 19 years. Now remember, Northwest Balkans, this is the result of the Yugoslav Civil War and many of the young men that we were working with were either directly involved in that they were you know, within the siege of Sarajevo or they knew not just one but several members of their family or community who had been either you know, killed or, or maimed or injured uh, psychologically um, during that civil war. So um, the, the point of, of this um, operations research study was to work through the perspective of young men. It's what we would call um, youth-led research where you spend a whole lot of time, you know, six months to a year, first of all, establishing rapport using all different kinds of visualization techniques to let these young men express what are, um, what are the values of the society? What are the norms that are shaping their behaviors? How do they feel about gender equality? How do they experience the pressures of a gender regime on themselves because that's what happens, right? Socialization is to make you be, be that ideal man. And in Northwest Balkans, that is very gender inequitable in terms of the relationship with women and often expre expressed through intimate partner violence. So by using you know, the vision and um, the leadership of young men themselves, we produced with them and with CARE, Northwest, Northwest Balkans, this program of social media in school activity, out school activity, 
where they were able to address the various factors that were just pushing them in ways that they wanted to change because they wanted to see a better future for themselves and their families and they didn't want their country to fall back into the kind of um, tension and civil unrest that produced the Yugoslav Civil War. And I just want to tell you that those kinds of engagements, they're not short term. As we were saying earlier, this has been a seven year intervention, but the kind of change you see in those schools is fundamental. It's encouraging. This is what we want to see for every person. And these kinds of methodologies, yes, we use them in Sarajevo and Banja Luka and Pristina. We can also use them in Detroit and Baltimore and right here in the United States. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of my pitch for really why it's important to involve people in finding solutions for their own situations and then making sure that we document them. Gotta love research, I mean, that's my life. <laughs> um, because we don't want to keep repeating history. So we have nine minutes for a few questions. Uh, just raise your hand and uh, wait for the microphone to arrive before responding. Okay, go ahead in the front. Um, hello, thank you guys so much for your very beautiful insights and what you guys do. Um, regarding the bombing of the MSF hospital last October, I was wondering um, how should inter international institutions protect NGOs and IGOs and after, um, in crisis zones after a crisis and how do you guys you know, reevaluate, you know, um, the re facilitating resilience after these events. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that is definitely a really, I mean, a, a terrible event. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, um, part of the way they kept NGO safe was every big NGO had security officers who would call each other every morning and say, what are you hearing, what places are unsafe, and they would share the knowledge. Um, they also tracked the violence against respondents. And over the last decades, it, it used to be if you had the unit, you know, the Red Cross on your um, thing, or you were identified as a, especially a health respondent, you were protected, even in conflict zones. That is no longer the case. And in fact, they're often targeted. And so they are now tracking the upsurge in active. Um, cases of violence against NGOs and UN agencies and others. And I, the, there are two things. One is share, so you try and keep yourself protected and get advanced knowledge of any unrest. And then work really hard as an organization to figure out what your willingness to take risk is. You can't impose that on someone. But when I think about um, whether I will go to a, a conflict zone or a risky place, you know, it, it's hard. My family says, why are you going to Afghanistan again, right? Um, but there are people who are born, grow up, live and die in conflict zones. They do it every day and my heart just breaks for them. And if I'm not willing to put myself at risk, at least occasionally, then what kind of doctor am I that I'm not willing to care for those? And But I know that isn't for everyone, so you need to make sure it's voluntary, you need to make sure they're well trained, and then you do everything you can to minimize the risks while maximizing your ability to serve people. And we talked, the last question was about working with um, local communities. Um, I think that's the key. When I left in, in Ken Kenya when I was small, or my children were small, um, it seems like a nice, stable, safe place, but there were a lot of coup attempts when I was there, and I had places to hide my children in the house so that you know, if something went wrong, I knew where I could hide them. But I also knew my Kenyan colleagues would always protect me. Mm -hmm. They would put themselves at risk to protect me. So if you've got, if you're really, really working with the local community and you're doing things they care about, they'll help you stay safe. And we have to work in those places. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And thank you very much for your question. Um, it's particularly poignant for me because I was at the Chatham House dinner where the prize, the Chatham House Prize, was awarded to Médecins Sans Frontiers, I think it was four days after the, uh, the bombing. And so you can just imagine uh, the tenor um, of that evening. And um, Princess Anne, who um, is one of the patrons of Chatham House, gave the keynote address, and she called the bombing on the MS.
us out of hospital, uh, just a tragic failure of the international system to protect those who were working uh, to provide relief to the communities that have just been overwhelmingly uh, shattered uh, through these processes. And um, the president uh, of, of Médecins Sans Frontières, the international president, just called on the international community to honor uh, their obligations and to ensure much better coordination, please, so that this tragedy never happens again. But um, I'll just uh, pick up on, on Anne's last point. There will always, I suppose, um, be what they call uh, collateral damage, which is just a horrible thing for us to have to consider um, in terms of these kinds of crises. But having lived myself in, in Sub-Saharan Africa for 11 years and lived through several coups, um, you know, having actually been kidnapped, um, it is so important that um, we really understand the communities where we're living, that we have that incredible network of people who trust us, know us, know what it is our organizations are trying to do. Um, that, that is a safety net that you never, ever lose in terms of its value. And so this, this notion of working with communities to find solutions you know, to these kinds of crises is, is just underscored again and again. Okay, I think we have time for one more question um, in the back. Um, in regards to the media focus of the Syrian refugee crisis and how media attention explodes once refugees start to enter Western countries, how do we educate those who only get information from the media and what do we do when media attention fades? Wow, if I had a solution to that, <laughs> we, we would not have this problem with short-term attention and funding. Um, uh, one of the other breakout sessions um, included sort of innovative ways to deal with global health. I think stories, the part of the reason even the uh, European migration got on the news is we had a story of one really, really tragic event. Um, and so I think making those kinds of situations real the other thing I feel really strongly about uh, when you raise issues like we're doing here today that if you do not give people something to do about those issues in some way you inoculate them. So a media that covers one tragedy and then another tragedy and another tragedy without allowing people to feel like they can do it, it are really disempowering their listeners. And so the key is to find a way to have people be able to participate. It's particularly difficult in either disasters or conflicts because you don't really want them to go because it's really easy to do hard, uh, you know, incorrect things. And so what you need to do is build understanding and trust probably in whatever their favorite organization is that they believe in will do a good job and partner with that um, or train themselves up to, to go, but not just to show up either in a disaster zone or a conflict zone. There is one issue that I think um, is part of the Syrian media, um, but we haven't touched on, and that's mental health. And we, I don't think we can leave this conflict discussion about women and girls without talking about the psychosocial and mental health burden that um, these experiences leave on women. Ten years ago, we probably wouldn't ever have mentioned it in this kind of a setting because mental health was somehow not part of global health, but now there is a, a much greater focus on it. We have new conventions and protocols for how to deal with it. Our organization is now moving the next step, which I haven't seen done very much, and that is, do we know what we're doing is helping? I'm back to the data. We know we have good stuff. We know the participants appreciate it, but it did it help them cope? with either the gender-based violence or the disaster in the earthquake in Nepal or the conflict and the family they lost. We're not very good at measuring it yet, but we need to because the amount of mental health trauma is huge. And if we can get that into the media, I would be really excited. So I assume we have to close, but I really appreciate your question uh, in terms of the media. And of course, um, there's efforts to uh, insert ethical guidelines 
on how to report out on these uh, various kinds of um, situations uh, to ensure that, to the extent possible, it's, it's not sensationalizing, uh, it's not creating that hierarchy of harms uh, that sells newspapers or gets a number of clicks but really is not uh, diffusing a situation or extending help to people. The other thing is there is a diversity of media voices. So to the extent that we can hear from The Guardian uh, in the UK, and I recommend the Poverty Matters um, platform to you, or BuzzFeed. I mean, BuzzFeed, uh, their, their uh, front uh, reporter, uh, you know, Jenna went in first and reported out on the sexual assault, the sexual violence that was occurring as the Syrian refugees were moving into, into Europe. That kind of reporting helps to frame an issue, um, but you know, how do we encourage people to look at that diversity of media to get those very you know, different kinds of voices and perspectives, um, that's another challenge. And I, once more, just want to underscore what Anne said. Earlier, I had said that um, complications of pregnancy and delivery were among the leading causes of death for girls aged 15 to 19 years. Mm. The leading cause of death across the world is suicide and self-harm. Yeah. It's a very, very different world. Thank you. Sarah and Anne, this has been just fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us, and please uh, share.